हेलो फ्रेंड्स वेलकम टू द नीट पीजी स्पेशल दम लगा के हईशा सीरीज ऑफ आकाश पीजी प्लस जहां पर हम आपके साथ जी जान लगा देंगे ये एग्जाम क्रैक करने के लिए वी विल नॉट ओनली डिस्कस विद यू द प्रीवियस क्वेश्चंस एंड द प्रीवियस टॉपिक्स बट आल्सो गिव यू क्लूज एज टू हाउ यू नीड टू अप्रोच एनी क्वेश्चन द एक्सप्लेनेशन हैज बीन केप्ट टू द पॉइंट एंड इट इज सिंप्लीफाइड सो दैट योर प्रेशियस टाइम इज नॉट वेस्टेड बहुत बार ऐसा होता है दैट हम एक टॉपिक बहुत सारी बुक से पढ़ते हैं एंड स्टिल वी आर नॉट एबल टू आंसर द नेक्स्ट स्टेप द बेस्ट स्टेप द ट्रीटमेंट ऑफ चॉइस इन्वेस्टिगेशन ऑफ चॉइस एंड सो ऑन वी आर ब्रिंगिंग दिस क्लियर कट इन्फॉर्मेशन टू यू सो दैट एट द एंड ऑफ द सीरीज यू आर लेफ्ट विद ओनली क्लैरिटी एंड नो कन्फ्यूजन आफ्टर एवरी डिस्कशन देर आर अ सेट ऑफ क्वेश्चन दैट विल चैलेंज योर कॉन्सेप्ट एंड योर फैक्ट्स एंड ब्रिंग यू क्लोजर टू योर ड्रीम ऑफ क्रैकिंग द एग्जाम so let's start the discussion the first topic is ectopic pregnancy and gestational trophoblastic neoplasia the first question is all are causes of ectopic pregnancy except the highest risk factor is seen when the patient gives a history of a previous ectopic pregnancy the second highest risk factor is if she has had any tubal surgery other risk factors include prior history of any tubal infection any tubal adhesions artificial reproductive therapy and in contraception the highest is with progesterone iucd followed by copper t and progesterone only pill what does progesterone do it decreases the tubal motility so going through the options all are causes except iucd it is a cause previous tubal surgery yes previous ectopic definitely this is the most common cause combined oral contraceptive no it is progesterone only pill another important thing about ectopic the most common site is the ampulla and what is the earliest to rupture the earliest to rupture is isthmus because it is the narrowest portion pseudo sac is seen in Pseudo sac is the pathognomonic sign of ectopic pregnancy. What do we mean by that? So this is the uterus. We can see an echogenic uterus over here, and exactly in the center of the uterus. It is not eccentric. Had it been eccentric, it would have been here. It is exactly in the center of the uterus. We can see a mass which has irregular edges. So this is typical of a pseudo sac and ectopic pregnancy. Had it been a normal pregnancy, the mass would have been eccentric, and the margins of it would have been smooth. Also the first sign seen in intrauterine pregnancy is the intradecidual sign and we can also see a double decidual sign so your ectopic pregnancy is the answer another thing which is commonly seen in ectopic pregnancy is the ring of fire or the donut or the bagel sign and this sign is also seen in a corpus luteal cyst coming to the third question a second gravida presents a 6 week period of gestation to opd with complaints of shoulder tip pain her vitals as we can see here is unstable and ultrasound is showing fluid in the pouch of douglas So this is a clear cut case of a ruptured ectopic pregnancy. How do we come to diagnosis? Shoulder tip pain is because of the blood which is irritating the diaphragm and this is leading to a referred shoulder tip pain. And in ultrasound if it is showing fluid in pouch of Douglas which means that the tube has ruptured and this is a pathognomonic sign of a ruptured ectopic. So there is a very simplified chart over here how to deal with ectopic pregnancy questions. If the patient has a ruptured ectopic If there is cardiac activity present in the gestational sac if the patient is hemodynamically unstable please do not think about anything else no g sac no beta hcg you will directly go for salpingectomy okay if the patient wants to preserve her fertility or the other side of the tube has been operated upon then only you will go for salpingostomy otherwise the surgery of choice is salpingectomy okay so going back to the question Will we do laparotomy and salpingostomy? Let's come back to this. Do laparoscopy. Since the patient is unstable, we will not do laparoscopy. Will you give methotrexate? No medical management because she is unstable. It's a ruptured ectopic. Salpingostomy versus salpingectomy. We will definitely go ahead with the salpingectomy. Had they mentioned that the other side of the tube has been affected, or the patient does not have the other side of the tube because of the prior ectopic, then only we will go for a salpingostomy operation. Am I clear? Now question number 4 a second pra- gravida at 6 week period of gestation comes through opd her vitals are stable cardiac activity is absent ultrasound shows a gestational sac of 3 cm in the right adnex say beta hcg is 4000 what all can you do except okay so is she a case of ruptured ectopic no the cardiac activity is absent and she is hemodynamically stable So the next thing that we will see in this patient is the gestational sac size and the beta hcg value. So when all can you do an expectant management? It means when all can you wait and just watch? So when the serum beta hcg is less than 1000 and the gestational sac is less than 3.5. And when can we do medical management? 
we can do medical management up to the beta hcg value of 5000 and the sac size of up to less than 4 cm again going through the question although the sac size is 3 cm but the beta hcg value is 4000 right so what all can we do can you do a salpingectomy we can do the patient can always opt for a surgical option so salpingectomy and salpingostomy can always be done right methotrexate yes she's an ideal patient for medical management can you do expectant management no because although the sac size is less than 3.5 but the beta scg is 4000 and what is the limit for expectant management 1000 so therefore the answer of choice is expectant management now few points about methotrexate before giving methotrexate we have to do a serum beta hcg level because basis that only we are going to monitor the patient right also we have to do a cbc count of the patient we have to do a renal function test and liver function test because it tends to affect the liver and the kidney we also need to do a blood grouping and rh typing of the patient because if the patient is rh negative or ict negative we need to give antidote to the patient so day one again we will do serum beta hcg and we will give intramuscular methotrexate 50 mg per meter square Day 4, we are just going to take the sample of serum beta HCG. Day 7, again we will take the sample of serum beta HCG. Now, if between day 4 to day 7, the beta HCG decrease is by more than 15%, then we will repeat the beta HCG weekly till the values go less than 10 international units per liter. Okay? But if there is no decrease in beta HCG between day 4 to day 7, then we can repeat a second dose of methotrexate on day 7. Alright, you can also give option to the patient for go ahead with the surgical management. Another very important point, if we have given methotrexate to the patient, then we ask her to avoid pregnancy for 3 months. Another point I would like to add here that methotrexate is also given for molar pregnancy. If it is given in a multi-dose regimen, so then we ask patient to avoid conception for one year. This is a very important point. Okay. Now fifth question, patient presents to OPD with two months of amenorrhea. She is UPT positive. She is pregnant. No gestational sac is seen on the ultrasound. Vitals seem to be stable. Beta CG is 600. How are you going to manage this patient? Okay. So there is no gestational sac. So we all know that the beta SCG doubles after every 48 hours. So, we are going to do a serum beta CG level, repeat it after 48 hours. Now, there can be three scenarios, okay. If it is falling by more than 15%, the baseline level and the second day level, then it is, it can be, then the likely cause can be abortion. And for how long do we need to monitor the patient? We will do weekly serum beta HCG levels till the value go less than 10 international unit per liter, okay. The second is if the beta HCG is doubling, has doubled between day 0 and day 2 by more than 66%, then most likely it's an intrauterine pregnancy. Again, we will do weekly beta HCG till the levels go more than 2000. Why more than 2000? Because that is the discriminatory zone. And on TVS, we can see a gestational sac when the beta HCG is more than 2000. And on TS, what is the value? TS, the value is more than 6500 international unit. The gray zone is when the values are not falling by more than 15% and it is not doubling by more than 66% then that is the gray zone. What do we need to do then? It is most likelihood that it can be an ectopic pregnancy. So we will so we will monitor the serum beta SCG till it reaches 2000 international unit or it has it can also happen that it has plateaued. So if there are three plateau levels if there are three plateau levels or it has reached more than 2000, then we will repeat a TVS. If it is still negative, then we will go ahead with methotrexate. So coming back to the question, repeat ultrasound after 48 hours? No. Give methotrexate? Not right now. Give repeat beta CG after one week? No. We are going to repeat beta CG after 48 hours. Now the next question, what if the same patient presents to OPD? Here we can see that her beta HCG values have been taken on day 0 and day 2. The day 0 value is 450, day 2 value is 280. What is the most probable diagnosis? So we know that the fall is by more than 15%, right? So what can be the most likely diagnosis? It's an abortion or a failing pregnancy. So this is your answer. Another scenario, day 0 and day 2 sample show that beta HCG is 350 and on day 2 the sample is 600. So, how are you going to manage her? 
we can see that the beta HCG has doubled by more than 66%. So what are you going to do? It is most likely an intrauterine pregnancy and we will continue monitoring beta HCG weekly till it reaches 2000, right? So going through the options, we will repeat beta HCG weekly till it is more than 2000. Next question, an 8-week second gravida with previous LSCS presented with spotting per vagina. Transvaginal sonography showed cesarean scar pregnancy. What is the best management? Before going through the option, let's see what is cesarean scar pregnancy. So here what is happening that the ectopic is forming on the previous scar. This is the uterus. This is the bladder which is filled with urine. Here is the previous scar. We can see this is the previous scar. And the pregnancy is lying on the scar. So the most common symptom of this is that the patient will have painless vaginal bleeding. It is a very life-threatening condition. The complications include uterine rupture, there can be massive hemorrhage, there can be preterm labor, placental complications and it has very high maternal mortality rate. So what is the investigation of choice? Investigation of choice is transvaginal sonography and color doppler where we can see a lot of vascularity along the previous scar site. What is the management? Best management is laparotomy with excision of the gestational sac. Also, if the cardiac activity is present, then we can give intramuscular or intragestational methotrexate. So, going through the options, give methotrexate orally? No. Give intragestational sac methotrexate? Yes, it can be given. Confirm diagnosis by MRI. Now, TVS is the investigation of choice followed by color doppler. Just in case if it is inconclusive of both of these, then only we will go for MRI. If it has been confirmed by TVS, no need to go with this, alright? Excise the GSAC by laparotomy. This versus this, we will always prefer option number C. What is the investigation of previous scar site ectopic? It is color Doppler. What is the criteria for diagnosing abdominal pregnancy? This is a very often asked question. So it is the study for criteria. You just need to mug up this table. For abdominal, it is the study for criteria. For the cervical pregnancy, it is the Rubens criteria. And for the ovarian pregnancy, it is the Spiegelberg criteria. A 30-year-old female presents with 10 weeks history of amenorrhea, pain in abdomen. Ultrasound shows the following picture. So what is it? This is a typical snowstorm appearance. Okay. So this is a snowstorm appearance and this is seen in highlighted deform mold. Now the next question, a 25-year-old woman. Remember, this is 25. She's had evacuation of molar pregnancy. So the previous pregnancy was molar. She is now complaining of breathlessness, cough, bleeding, which means there has been metastasis. Chest x-ray is also showing cannonball metastasis. So this has gone to the lung. Beta HCG level is 10 raised to power 3. Now they have been asking a lot of questions around the FIGO classification of gestation trophoblastic neoplasia. Score is given from 0 to 4. 8 factors are assessed and the mnemonic of which is SAM is bad. Okay. So S is your largest tumor size. A is your age in years. Then M is metastasis site and metastasis number. After that, I is interval months from the end of the index pregnancy to the start of the treatment. B is your beta HCG value. A is what was the antecedent pregnancy? Was it a molar pregnancy, abortion or previous live birth? Highest risk is when the patient had a previous live birth. And after that, the last is previous failed chemotherapy. If it was a single drug or if it was a multiple drug. Okay. If the FIGO classification score is less than 6, we will give patient injection methotrexate alternating with folinic acid for 1 week. After that, a 1 week rest and we will do this till 6 weeks post normalization of beta HCG. If the FIGO classification risk is more than 7, then we will put the patient on Imaco regimen. What is the maximum risk of gestational trophoblastic neoplasia in case of prior so, the maximum risk of gestational trophoblastic, we can see that if she had a previous live birth and after that, she has been diagnosed of gestational trophoblastic neoplasia, it carries the highest risk and a previous molar pregnancy carries the lowest risk, okay? So, the answer here will be a previous term pregnancy. All are true about complete mole except, okay? So, first of all, what is gestational trophoblastic disease? It comprises of hydatidiform moles which can be complete or partial, invasive mole, choriocarcinoma or placental site trophoblastic tumor. Now, what is gestational trophoblastic neoplasia? When after the treatment of gestational trophoblastic disease, beta HCG continues to be high or it plateaus. Okay. Now, comparing complete and partial mole. So, complete mole is deployed. Partial mole is deployed. There are increased chances of carcinomatous changes in the complete mole. There are lesser chances of carcinomatous changes in the partial mole. 
also the fetal tissue is going to be absent in a complete mole however some tissue can be present in a partial mole p57 immunostaining will be positive in partial mole whereas negative in the complete mole okay so what is to accept it is diploid it has high risk of gtn fetal tissue is absent okay what is the best management for molar pregnancy the best management is ultrasound guided suction and evacuation because the uterus is extremely friable and if it is not done under ultrasound guidance then the uterus can get perforated with the suction tube use of prostaglandins is not recommended for cervical tightening because it can lead to embolization of the trophoblastic cells therefore it is contraindicated about oxytocin generally it is avoided but if the patient is bleeding after evacuation she is having pph then we can give oxytocin after evacuation what are you supposed to do you supposed to send the tissue to the lab to confirm the diagnosis whether it's a molar pregnancy in that also whether it's a complete or a partial mole or is it a neoplasia okay second thing if the patient is rh negative do not forget to give her anti d injection third thing we have to take a beta hcg value because basis that we are going to further follow up the patient right if the patient complains of bleeding continuously after mtp it means there can be two things retained product or it is a gestational trophoblastic neoplasia so we have to repeat beta hcg values and we have to do a tbs scan now post evacuation surveillance by beta hcg is very important if it is a complete mole we will repeat beta hcg testing every two weekly now everywhere we do beta hcg testing two weekly okay and we will do this for 56 days if after 56 days we see that the beta hcg has normalized then we will do it every two weekly for further 6 months if beta hcg has not normalized by 56 days we will repeat it every two weekly till 6 months post normalization of beta hcg okay for partial mole it is simple beta hcg is done every two weekly till two samples come negative four weeks apart so this brings to the end of our discussion next week we'll be discussing gestational diabetes mellitus and hypertension in pregnancy so be prepared <laughs>